Consider supporting this channel for as little as $5 a month on Patreon. You can also commission future content for this game. Link is in the description. You can also send a one-time donation of any amount to this channel using PayPal. Link is in the description. This is part 5 of everything I hate about the trucking industry. Here, I'm going to be building Roanoke Island as I talk about some more reasons the trucking industry sucks. In this part, we'll be talking about how you can be fired for what you did while driving your car, how you can spend days waiting for a trailer, how they always give you the wrong shipping ID, why I hate truck stops and love rest areas, how every on-duty status must take exactly 15 minutes, how I hate merging on the highway and dealing with merging traffic, and filling the tires with air. But first, there are a few things I forgot to mention about truck driving schools and trainers. Again, I use that term lightly since they don't train you. Someone please remind me why the government requires you to go to these dumb schools to become a truck driver. I didn't learn anything important from these teachers. Rather, I learned horrid techniques that caused me to fail the test. I was taught that if you need to turn at an intersection and someone is in your way, just block them and make them back up. Wrong? Stop! Don't you see the car? By the way, it's an insta-fail when the instructor tells you to stop. He also complained that my windshield wipers were on too low of a setting, even though it wasn't raining by any sense of the word. There were like five drops on the windshield. The automatic sensors on my 2007 BMW 328xi wouldn't even have wasted their processing power to wipe the windshield with such a low number of drops, even on the highest automatic setting. And this is a computer whose job it is to wipe the windshield only when there are too many drops. So this guy claims to be smarter than the computers in my car. I've never seen the truck driver put their windshield wipers on high and extremely low range, so I have no idea what this fool's talking about. Also, he failed me for this, but passed someone else who did the exact same thing, so I guess this rule only applies to me? I failed the test doing exactly what the teachers taught me to do. Truck driving schools should be abolished. These schools are so lax that they'll even pass someone who can't speak English, a legal requirement. For example, there was a crash on I-70 caused by a truck driver whose brakes failed. There were signs warning of emergency truck ramps, but he couldn't read English well enough to read these signs. I don't think he deserved to go to jail. Rather, the trucking school that passed him knowing he couldn't speak English should be shut down. To me, this is another example of the trucking industry taking advantage of rookie drivers. The selfish people in charge of that school should be made to pay for the damages. They should all go to jail for negligence. Also, I'm glad I didn't have a CB radio because apparently truck drivers are such atrocious human beings that they would rather make fun of a rookie driver to the point of crying rather than helping them. I sort of touched on this when I discussed how a truck driver might film you making a mistake to put on YouTube because other people's humiliation is funny, but truck drivers are such jerks. They're like the cliche bullies you see in movies. Now for some additional complaints about trainers, or as I like to call them, people who don't teach you how to drive the truck. Firstly, most of them smoke. Though they give you the option to be paired with someone who doesn't smoke, most truck drivers have horrible smoking habits, so if you go with this option, you'll have a long wait. Eventually, I gave up and said, fine, I'll go with someone who chews tobacco. But Christ almighty did it gross me out watching him spit tobacco into a cup. It honestly made me want to throw up. <laughs> you know, my first trainer quit to drive for Pepsi. That gave me a bad feeling. I thought, hmm, does he know something I don't know? He wasn't that observant. Probably because he thought, well, I'm quitting anyway, so it's not my problem. My second trainer was kind of gross. He tried to make me pee in a bottle. Like, we were at a truck stop and there was a bathroom there, so why would I pee in the bottle? What is wrong with truck drivers? Eventually, he took some time off for a family emergency. He dropped me off at a hotel saying, I called them and they're gonna send you a trainer. A week later, they still hadn't assigned me one. This is normal because, as mentioned earlier, it takes forever to find a trainer that doesn't smoke. Despite this, they gave me a call asking me what I was doing lounging about in a hotel while I was supposed to be out with a trainer. 
they said, we don't pay you to hang out in the hotel. This is Werner. First of all, I love that they said this because it only proves a point I made in a previous part about trucking companies gaslighting rookie drivers. Second, this hotel was in the middle of nowhere. It didn't have cable or Wi-Fi. Half the time I didn't have a cell phone signal. It didn't have free meals. I ran out of food and had to walk five miles to a Walmart for groceries and somehow these bozos thought I was doing this for fun? They asked, why didn't you call, even though I've never had to do that before? Imagine being told one thing, then having the rules suddenly changed right from under you. In fact, since we're in the Outer Banks, let's use a lighthouse analogy. For context, at night, lighthouses have flash characteristics, unique light patterns that only belong to them. It tells you something about itself and your current location. For example, if you see four flashes every 10 seconds, that means I am the Oak Island Lighthouse and you are approaching the entrance to the Cape Fear River. But if you see one flash every seven and a half seconds, that means I am the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse and you are dangerously close to the Diamond Shoals. Let's say, hypothetically, you're piloting a ship on its way to the Cape Fear River and for whatever reason, you lose all navigation but you see four flashes every 10 seconds in the distance. You check your light list, a list of every single lighthouse, its paint scheme, flash characteristic, and what it all means. You quickly recognize it as the Oak Island Lighthouse and realize you are approaching the entrance to the Cape Fear River. Except you run aground on the Diamond Shoals off the coast of Buxton, North Carolina. You ask yourself, what happened? You then receive an angry call from the owner of the ship saying, How could you confuse Oak Island for Cape Hatteras? You must have did that on purpose. You should have known we swapped the flash characteristics of the Cape Hatteras and Oak Island lighthouses, even though we didn't update this information. Of course, you're confused. Ever since you started sailing, four flashes every 10 seconds has always been the Oak Island Lighthouse. All of a sudden, they change the rules without telling you, then get mad at you for not being aware of the changes. This is how I felt while receiving this call. I was legitimately afraid they were going to fire me, leaving me stranded in the middle of nowhere with no money and no way to get home. There was no bus stop or train station within walking distance, and I spent a lot of money for a taxi ride back to the hotel because I was too tired to walk another five miles back. Believe it or not, a trucking company would leave you stranded in the middle of nowhere without a second thought. My third trainer was that pretentious owner-operator jerk I mentioned earlier. He gave me horrible advice that ruined my driving, but saved him a couple bucks on fuel. The only th good thing about him was he took two weeks off for Christmas. During this time, I visited the St. Augustine Lighthouse. I also wanted to go to the Ponce de Leon Inlet Lighthouse, but it cost too much money to go from Jacksonville to Daytona Beach by Uber. I also saw the movie Concussion in a nearby theater. On that day, I found out that in Florida, it can be 90 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and 32 degrees Fahrenheit at night. The transition is so fast you don't even have enough time to process it. I remember thinking, it feels hot and cold at the same time. What is happening? The trainer they sent me with one week before firing me once said to me, ask any gay person how they got that way, and they'll say that they were molested by a gay person at a young age. And that's all you need to know about him. For crying out loud, imagine if someone said to you, ask any straight person how they got that way, and they'll say they were molested by a straight person at a young age. That's such a stupid argument. This guy also recommended washing your glasses with Windex, which is a bad idea because it removes a microscopic layer from your lenses, potentially damaging them and your eyesight as well. The trainer I had at Western Express had a thick New Jersey accent, which was bad for me because I can't understand anyone from New Jersey to save my life. Especially the ghetto accents. They talk at a million miles per hour, or 1,609,344 kilometers per hour, and they skip over several consonants. Through a lot of struggle, I did get used to it, though it was really difficult. He would get so impatient with me when I couldn't understand him, shouting commands at me repeatedly. He also gave contradictory orders like, F the GPS! Just follow the GPS! This was confusing and frustrating. Eventually, I lost all patience with him and quit. 
They later called to ask why I quit, but if they thought that impatient guy shouting contradictory orders was a good trainer, I don't know what to say to them. Here's a complaint from someone other than me. While waiting for a trainer with Werner Express, one coworker told me that while he was out with a trainer at Covenant, the trainer paid for his meal at a truck stop, then said as payment he owed him sex. He then quit, but they didn't offer him any transport home besides a bus ticket. Which surprised me, because usually if you quit, they don't offer you any transportation home. There have even been times when a trucking company promised a busload of people an opportunity, hired like one or two of them, then told the others to go home without covering their transportation. Trucking companies are just awful. Speaking of sexual harassment, trucking companies would hire an ex-convict who went to jail for a sexual offense as a trainer and put them in the same truck as a female driver because apparently these companies are run by idiots. Oi, I'm getting so demonetized for this. Anyway, let's get back to the actual video. There's a Japanese song that goes Saki made to iteru koto shigao janai, which means what you said earlier and what you're saying now are totally different. Whenever I hear that one line, I think of the trucking industry. That line might as well be every trucking company's slogan, because they always tell you one thing, but go back on their words later on. So, did you know you can be denied a job or fired for what you did in your car? For example, let's say your car's inspection is due, but you drive it anyway and get caught. That's a moving violation, and moving violations can result in you not getting a job, which is dumb because the ticket costs less than the cost of you getting the car inspected, finding out it needs over $600 in repairs, then overdrafting your account to get those repairs made and pay the rent at the same time. Ask me how I know. Tickets also stupidly cost more if you're a commercial driver, even if you weren't driving a commercial motor vehicle at the time. You have to drive dangerously slow on the highway, causing everyone else to pass you just to avoid a ticket, meaning I have to be constantly in danger of getting rear-ended so my career won't suffer. There should be two separate records, one for private vehicles and one for commercial vehicles, and your private record should not be used against you when looking for a job because cars handle differently compared to commercial vehicles. Plus, people expect you to drive slow when driving a CMV, but when driving a car, the inverse is true. Now let's talk about being rushed to a location only to find out the destination isn't ready to receive you. This is just another example of why you should ignore the fleet manager. They'll rush you to a location to pick up a trailer, and they won't even be finished loading it when you get there. They'll rush you to drop off a trailer, and the unloaders won't even be present when you get there. All our unloaders went home. You're gonna have to come back tomorrow. What I don't understand is, they have GPS that they use to spy on you, so why is it so hard to have another trailer ready for you the moment you drop off a trailer? You don't get paid while waiting to be assigned a load, so it's really bad for your wallet spending days waiting for a trailer. My trainer once spent three or four days just waiting for a trailer. Once I waited so long for a trailer, I took an Uber to a nearby mall, saw the good dinosaur, bought video games for my PlayStation 3 at GameStop, took another Uber back, and they still haven't assigned me a trailer yet. I did get a message, but it just said, we're still trying to get a trailer for you. Hang tight. Did these people not realize I'm not making any money? I mean, my goodness, warehouses have downtown too, but as boring as it is, at least they pay you during this time or let you go home for the day, what is known as VTO or voluntary time off. Don't get me wrong, I'm not necessarily defending warehouses. I've worked for some that would fire you for not pretending to be busy during this time. They each got their own flaws. I got so tired of rushing to a warehouse or factory only for the trailer to not be ready, I decided to make a habit of waiting hours to pick up a trailer just to make sure it's even ready when I get there. And I got so tired of being told, all our workers have gone home for the day, you have to come back tomorrow, that I just pull into a nearby truck stop or rest area and wait for them to be ready to unload it. 
By the way, these guys are never ready to unload you between 5 p.m. and 8 a.m. because warehouses are usually closed during these hours. So if you're scheduled to make a delivery during those times, get ready to be turned away and make sure you have enough drive time to get to a truck stop or rest area because as mentioned earlier, they won't let you park on their property even if they're closed. Some will, but they're the exceptions, not the rule. Prepare for the worst in all situations. This is also why I say to ignore the fleet manager. They'll be like, hurry up, the trailer needs to be picked up now. Then you get there and they haven't even finished loading the damn thing. Someone at another company once got into an accident this way. He had just taken some sleeping pills because he was preparing for his 10 hour mandatory rest break. His fleet manager calls and says he needs to rush towards the location to pick up a trailer. The driver says, but I don't have any more hours and I just took some sleeping pills. Now, after what I said previously about fleet managers, what do you think his response would be? A. I don't care. Just do it. Or B. That's alright. I understand. I'll just tell them you can't move right now because it wouldn't be safe. He went with option A. The driver later got into an accident caused by the sleeping pills. He then explains that the fleet manager told him to drive despite him needing a rest break. Now, after what I've said about fleet managers, what do you think his response would be? A. Yeah, I told him to drive illegally. It was wrong and I shouldn't have done it. Or B. I've never told him to do that. He went with option B. Now, obviously, he should have refused to drive, but managers should not be telling you to break the law in the first place. Imagine if your only other experience with jobs was in retail, where going against your manager is a bad thing. Now imagine you're a truck driver and your fleet manager tells you to drive dangerously or get fired. There's actually a way to prevent this. Download a call recording app and record everything your fleet manager says. If he tries to force you to do something illegal, take the recording to the authorities, either the police or OSHA. If enough drivers did this, I'll bet fleet managers will think twice about what they're about to say to you. Also, I wouldn't bother contacting the company's safety department because they usually don't care. Now let's talk about paperwork. Shipping IDs specifically. When you bring in a loaded trailer, the customer asks for a shipping ID or shipping number. They'd always give me the wrong number. Here's how the conversation would usually go. Got a trailer of rolls of paper for you. What's the tracking number? 39872098E45. Then he enters the number into his machine. That's not showing up. Then I'd call the fleet manager or um, the company in general. I forget which. They say the number is not showing up. Try L4892PO908. Okay. L4892PO908. Then they'd enter that number into the system. That's not it either. It's usually an 18 digit number that starts with ASV and ends in 8908. Okay. They say it's usually an 18 digit number that starts with ASV and ends in 8908. Okay. Try ASV R409678. 812-728-908 Okay, is it ASV R40-967-812-728-908? Yeah, that's the one. Finally! Alright, first of all, let's get something straight. Railroads do this better. They have barcodes on the side of the train cars. There are barcode readers on the side of the tracks. As a train passes the barcode reader, it scans each car and the railroad and the customer instantly know where the cargo is. How do trucking companies know where anything is when they can't even keep track of the shipping numbers which never match what's on the bill of lading? How is this a thing? Just put barcodes on the sides of the trailer and have the customer scan them upon arrival. Now let's talk about truck stops. I hate them. I mean, there are a lot of great facilities there. Would be nice if ample parking was one of them. As mentioned earlier, there's hardly enough parking in these places and sometimes they charge you for them. 
They also smell like pee because truck drivers are slobs and would rather pee outside underneath their trucks than use the restroom that's right there! They also have a gross habit of throwing bottles of human waste on the ground or even bags of, well, you know. Once, on a mildly warm day, I thought, you know, it's a nice day. I think I'll open a window. Big mistake! The second I opened the window, all I smelt was pee. Thanks a lot, you slobs. You ruined my chance of getting an ounce of fresh air. Just use the freaking restrooms. Truck stops also have showers, but my trainer warned me to wear sandals and use your own rags and towels, saying, because you don't know what they've been doing in there. Oh, and if you take longer than a few seconds to back up, other truck drivers will blow their horns at you rudely. Fun! So why do I choose rest areas over truck stops? First of all, at rest areas, you pull straight into a parking space getting rid of that issue of truck drivers using their horns rudely. Actually, that's the only reason. Other truck drivers got on my nerves so much, I went to rest areas just to escape them. I only went to truck stops to wash my laundry or take a shower. Now let's talk about fueling. It's really dumb. When fueling a school bus, I just fuel the bus and leave. But in the trucking industry, since everything must take 15 minutes, you can't just leave when the fueling is done. Why is that anyway? Why does every on-duty status have to take 15 minutes? It's not like they pay you for it. Why can't I just fuel up the truck and go? Why is it that if it takes 5 minutes to fuel, I still have to stay there for an additional 10 minutes before I can leave? But all that aside, there's something else I hate about fueling, pumping DEF or diesel exhaust fluid. Coincidentally, DEF stands for definitely in Japanese, and DEF is definitely a pain in the rear, especially when it comes to pumping it. Why? Let's see. First of all, I could never figure out how to get the goddamn DEF pump to work. My trainer said, Insert the membership card to accumulate points for a free shower. Then insert the fuel card, a company issued debit card that only works on fuel. Then when it asks, do you also want to pump DEF? Press yes or no. Then place the pumps in the respective holes and start fueling. I did all these things. I inserted the membership card, then inserted the fuel card. Then when it asked, do you also want to pump DEF? I pressed yes. Then I placed the pumps in their respective holes and started fueling. Despite this, I could only ever get the fuel pumps to work and not the DEF pump. I don't know why though. If I did everything right, it should have worked. My trainer also said, make sure the driver's side fuel pump is on because if it isn't, none of the other pumps will work. I made sure the driver's side pump was on, but the DEF pump still wouldn't work. I always had to call the truck stop manager and have him fix the pump. Every single time, the DEF pumps would never work. It is time to talk about merging on the highway. All you city planners out there, I got a question for you. How long do you guys think it takes for a truck to accelerate the traffic speed? Most on-ramps have a speed limit of 25 to 35 miles per hour, so let me see if I got this straight. I'm supposed to merge on the highway at 25 miles per hour while everyone around me is going 65 to 90 miles per hour. Yeah, don't see how that could end badly. The truck driving school gave me the poor advice of force your way in, they'll get out of the way if they don't want to get hit. This is bad advice because the highway traffic has the right of way. If you force your way in and an accident happens, you'll be blamed for the accident. Of course, the only other option is stopping at the end of the on-ramp and waiting for a big enough gap, but then you'd be pulling into traffic at almost 0 miles per hour while everyone around you is going between 65 and 90 miles per hour. By the way, if you're wondering who's driving at 90 miles per hour, drive on US 22 at 4 a.m. and you'll see what I mean. So basically, your choices for merging on the highway are dangerously or dangerously. Thanks a lot, city planners. If I plan an on-ramp, it would add a lane rather than merging with an existing one for at least 5 miles before merging. This would give trucks ample time to reach the speed of traffic. Another issue I faced was people, including truck drivers, cutting me off in traffic. 
Once when I was on I-90 in New York State, a truck driver cut me off getting on the highway without even checking his mirrors. He merged onto the highway doing 20 miles per hour while I and everybody else are going 70 miles per hour. I tried to make a left lane change to avoid a collision, but there was a dumb pickup driver on the left lane ignoring my left turn signal. On a side note, I read that if a truck driver puts on their turn signal and you're still next to them, just blow your horn. This is the most stupid car driving advice I have ever heard. Truck drivers cannot hear your prissy little car horns over the sound of their massive roaring engines. You're better off getting out of the way. Either speed up to get in front of them or slow down to get behind them, but don't stay next to them! I decided to put my four ways on and drive between the left and right lanes. Luckily, the pickup driver got the memo and moved into the left shoulder, allowing me to move the rest of the way over. Then I slowed down and let him back on. I didn't want to have to do that, but I also didn't want to die or possibly injure my trainer, so... Something similar happened to me in South Carolina. There was a guy merging on the highway. I decided to let him on and slow down slightly. This was a big mistake. He got on the highway, then immediately slammed on his brakes, causing me to have to do the same. Luckily, there was no one behind me. Like last time, I couldn't go left because there was a car in the left lane, completely oblivious to my left turn signal. My trainer woke up from the heavy braking, then started yelling at me. You know, as a trainer does. He said, you can't just stop on the highway like that ever. He then said, that's your fault because you don't watch your mirrors. <sighs> to which I thought, how could you possibly know how much I've been looking at my mirrors when you've been asleep all that time? I've been looking at my mirrors, but that don't change nothing when there's a car next to you blocking you from making a lane change. It's not like I didn't know if there was a car there. I knew for a fact that there was one, but I can't make others get out of the way. If they ain't gonna move, what's a rookie driver to do? Also, let's review something. What did it say in the driver's license manual is the most important thing to know about trucks? Anyone? If you answered that they take longer than you to stop, you answered correctly. What that truck driver did to me earlier and what that car driver did to me was like if a jogger ran in front of a train and expected it to slow down to his or her speed. Nope, you gonna die. Also, to the car driver, why would you slow down when you were already on the highway and already matching the speed of traffic? Whoever told you to merge with traffic and slow down after you already are matching their speed was an idiot! Wouldn't it be nice at the truck driving school, any of my three trainers, or my one trainer from Western Express, offered any kind of insight on how to deal with that specific issue? Now let's talk about why I hate filling the tires with air. Oh boy. One night, after driving for about ten and a half hours, I thought to myself, since I'm already at a truck stop, let's check the tire pressure. I checked the tire pressure and the steering and driving tires were a little low by about 10 psi. Now after everything I've said about the trucking industry so far, what do you think will happen? A. It'll go as I planned. Or B. It's nowhere as simple a task as I thought it would be. To make sure I didn't screw something up, I asked someone, how do you fill the tires? They vaguely answered, well just like filling the tires in your car. By the way, three trainers, and not one of them taught me how to fill the tires with air. So, if it's just like filling your car tires, here's how it should work. One, turn on the machine. Two, set the desired PSI. Three, place the hose over the valve stem. Four, the tire pressure will increase. Five, the machine will stop when you reach the desired PSI. Six, remove the hose, rinse and repeat. Here's what happened instead. 1. Turn on the machine. 2. You can't set the PSI. You have to use guesswork. 3. Place the hose over the valve stem. 4. The tire pressure will DECREASE! Wait a minute, what? 
I placed the hose over the valve stem for 15 minutes and the pressure didn't increase by even 1 PSI. Rather, it decreased by about 2 PSI. Why is the pressure decreasing? I thought to myself. I tried this four times with similar results. I then checked all the tires for leaks. There were none. I didn't hear any air escaping. There were no abrasions, bulges, or cuts. The tires were not unusually worn. The tread depth was correct. I couldn't find anything wrong with these tires. So why couldn't I get no air in them? Who knows? After 30 minutes of this, I gave up thinking, well, I'm going to be fired by the time I figure this out anyway. Let it be some other person's problem. This is clearly not like filling your car tires. Usually when filling your car tires, the pressure doesn't decrease! Thank goodness school bus drivers don't have to fill the tires with air. That's the shop's job. I don't know what I had to do if I had to do that. Then again, the school bus company probably would have trained me on how to do that. Anyway, that's all I have for now. In the next part, I'll be talking about mud flaps, drum brakes, and how awfully designed they are, trainers dropping you off at a random bus stop, and DLT physicals. Thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.